guys welcome back to another video lesson from Ross Medical Lectures. In this lesson we are going to be talking about Clostridium tetani and my name is Tania Rose Jacob. Before we begin if this is your first time in our channel and watching our video please subscribe to our channel below and make sure that you hit the bell icon so that you will be notified as soon as our new video lessons become available to you guys. I really truly value your subscriptions, likes, comments that you guys leave because they really go a long way to help support the channel and for that I do want to really thank you guys. The slides based on this lecture and many medical flashcards are available in my Instagram page rose medical lectures the link of my insta page is given in the description box let's move on to the topic clostridium tetani clostridium tetani is a gram positive bacteria that is it take the purple color on gram staining and it's a rod shaped bacteria it's an obligate anaerobe that is it doesn't require oxygen for its survival. This bacteria is widely distributed in soil, hospital environment and intestine of man and animals. The Clostridium tetani is the causative agent of tetanus which is an acute disease manifested by skeletal muscle spasm and autonomic nervous system disturbances. See in this diagram you can see the terminal round spores of this bacteria over here. Next let's move on to the virulence factor of this bacteria. Virulence factor means a factor that can enhance the ability of a bacteria to cause a disease, right? Here we have two virulence factor, tetanolysin and tetanospasmin. The tetanospasmin is also known as tetanus toxin. First let's see what is tetanolysin. The tetanolysin is a heat and oxygen labile that is it get deactivated in presence of oxygen and at high temperature. So this tetanolysin is basically a hemolysin that causes the destruction of tissues. The one point we should remember here is this, this hemolysin is antigenically related to the hemolysins produced by the Clostridium porphyrinchens and Streptococcus pyogenes and Streptococcus pneumoniae. Even if it is a virulence factor, it has no role in the pathogenesis of tetanus. The second virulence factor is tetanospasmin or tetanus toxin. Basically, this tetanospasmin or tetanus toxin is a neurotoxin which is responsible for disease manifestations. The tetanus toxin is heat labile like tetanolysin but the tetanus toxin is oxygen stable. This tetanus toxin is produced as a single 150 kilodalton polypeptide chain. Then this chain is cleaved into two, a heavy 100 kilodalton chain and a light 50 kilodalton chain which is joined by a disulfide bond. This tetanus toxin is antigenic and specifically neutralized by its antitoxin. Antitoxin is nothing but an antibody that counteracts a toxin. From the name itself it's clear, anti means against, so antitoxin means against bacterial toxin. This tetanus toxin can be converted to toxoid form using formaldehyde. Toxoid means inactivated toxin. Since we convert it into a toxoid form, it loses its virulence property but still it has its antigenic property. Because of this reason, we can use this for vaccine preparation. Next, let's see the mechanism of action of tetanus toxin. We know the tetanus, the disease caused by this bacteria, is a very painful disease in which the muscle contract involuntarily. Usually, the skeletal muscle contract based on the signals from the inhibitory and excitatory neuron. When an excitatory neuron in the spinal cord fires, it releases the excitatory neurotransmitter into a motor neuron. The motor neuron fires and sending the signal down to the axon and stimulate the muscle fibers to contract. The signals from the excitatory neurons often combines with the signal from the inhibitory neuron. The two competing signals cancel each other out which reduces the number of excitatory signals reaching the muscle fiber and thereby decreases the force of muscle contraction. In the diseased stage, the inhibitory neuron fires but it fails to release the neurotransmitter molecule. 
but the excitatory neuron continues to act and result in the muscle spasm which is a characteristics of tetanus in this diagram you can see the mechanism of action of tetanus toxin next let's move on to the mode of transmission the tetanus bacilli can enter through the wounds as a result of superficial abrasions punctured wounds road traffic accidents or it can be transmitted while doing surgery without proper asepsis the neonatal sepsis is associated with non sterile practices fourth mode of transmission is autogenic tetanus here a considerable devitalized tissue located in the middle ear or mastoid in chronic suppurative otitis media provides an ideal growth medium for the anaerobic tetanus organism the one more thing is it is a non infectious that is there is no person to person spread when we when we come to clinical manifestation the incubation period of this bacteria is only 6 to 10 days we know the tetanus toxin reaches the cns retrogradely so the muscles of the face and jaws are affected first due to the shorter distance for the toxin to reach the presynaptic terminal first symptom of tetanus is locked jaw or trismus in trismus or locked jaw there will be uncontrolled muscle contraction occurring in the muscles of mastication so that the patient is unable to open his or her mouth when we consider the neonates the neonates with tetanus will be presented with difficulty in feeding there the type of tetanus there are mainly three type of tetanus first one localized tetanus second one cephalic tetanus and third one is generalized tetanus localized tetanus it fairly rare and it is rarely fatal and you have the uncontrolled spasm in the area that is affected by the wound in short we can tell that localized tetanus is confined to the area of wound second one is cephalic tetanus it happens due to a wound in the face which in turn create facial spasms third one is generalized tetanus it is the most common type of tetanus here you have an uncontrolled spasm of the entire body in tetanus hands and feet are spared and the deep tendon reflexes are exaggerated autonomic disturbances is maximal during the second week of severe tetanus which is characterized by low or high blood pressure tachycardia intestinal stasis sweating increased tracheal secretion and acute renal failure when when we come to complications here we will discuss some terms first von rainer sardonicus it is when there is an uncontrolled muscle contraction occur in the muscles of facial expression second one opisthotonos it happens when there is uncontrolled muscle contraction in back muscles due to the generalized spastic contraction of the extensor muscle the affected person shows some abnormal postures of the body third one spasm of the respiratory muscle that can cause airway obstruction here you can see the diagram showing the log jaw or trismus here you can in this diagram you can see opisthotonos over here and here the rhinus sardonicus tetanus is common in the developing countries like india due to the warm climate rural area with fertile soil and hygienic surgeries and deliveries however the incidence of tetanus has been reduced due to immunization or vaccination of infants and pregnant mothers next let's move on to the laboratory diagnosis the specimen we should use here is excised tissue bits from the necrotic depths of the wound are more reliable than wound swabs so the specimen used is excised tissue bits on gram staining we can see purple colored bacilli with terminal and round spores because of this terminal spores it has drumstick appearance because the spores produce a bulging at the end so it appear like stick of a drum however, however microscopy alone is not sufficient as it, is, it cannot distinguish clostridium tetani from morphologically similar non pathogenic clostridia like clostridium tetanomorphum and clostridium spinoids so we are performing culture the culture is more reliable than microscopy 
Robertson cooked meat broth, the bacteria, being proteolytic, they turn the meat particles into black and produce foul odor. On blood agar with polymyxin B, these plates are incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for 24 to 28 hours under anaerobic condition. The Clostridium tetani produce characteristic swarming growth on blood agar. On blood agar, it produces swarming growth. Next, let's see the toxigenicity test. Before that, you can see here the swarming growth of this bacteria on blood agar and you can see the black color the meat you can see. here you can see how it appear in the robertson's cooked meat broth next let's see the toxigenicity test toxigenicity can be detected by both in vitro and in vivo methods why we are performing the toxigenicity test the answer is we know the pathogenesis of tetanus is toxin mediated so the association of the isolated organism can only be established when its toxin production is demonstrated in short we can tell that toxicity testing is aimed to de determine the presence of toxin production as i told you already toxicity can be detected by both in vitro and in vivo methods First, let's see in vitro hemolysis inhibition test. The main point we should remember here is this test indicates the production of only tetanolysin but not tetanospasmin. Whereas in vivo mouse inoculation test indicate the production of tetanospasmin. In case of in vitro hemolysis inhibition test, we know the Clostridium tetanae produces hemolysin on blood agar. So, like the test name, hemolysis is inhibited by adding antitoxin. Another toxigenicity test is in vivo mouse inoculation test. We already discussed in cultural characteristic part that in Robertson cooked meat broth, the Clostridium tetanae being proteolytic, it turned the meat particles into a black and produces a foul odor. So, in this test, if we inject the RCM broth with a black turbid growth into the root of the tail of the test mouse, the test animal develops stiffness which begins with the tail of the mouse and progresses to the hind limb and then to the trunk and to the forelimbs. Death occurs within two days. In vivo mouse inoculation test indicate the presence of tetanospasmin, the virulent factor responsible for disease. Let's see about the treatment of tetanus. Passive immunization or tetanus immunoglobulin is the treatment of choice for tetanus, whereas antibiotics have minor role in treatment. We will discuss about antibiotics after passive immunization. In the passive immunization, two preparations are available. First one HTIG means human tetanus immunoglobulin. Second one ATS anti tetanus serum. The dosage of HTIG is 250 international unit and the dosage of ATS is 1500 international units. Both of these are given as single intramuscular dose. Intra but the intrathecal route is more effective. Duration of protection of HTIG lasts for 30 days and of ATS lasts for 7 to 10 days because both of these are passive immunization right. Among HTIG and ATS, the HTIG is preferred because ATS is associated with some side effects such as serum sickness and anaphylactoid reaction. It's about passive immunization or tetanus immunoglobulin. Next treatment method is combined immunization that is both active and passive immunization. In non-vaccinated person, it is ideal to immunize with the first dose of tetanus tox toxoid or TT vaccine in 1 arm along with the administration of ATS or HTIG in the another arm followed by a complete course of TT vaccine as per the schedule. Third treatment method is using antibiotics. Antibiotics play a very minor role as they cannot neutralize the already released toxins. However, they are useful in two conditions. First one in early infection before the expression of toxin. Second one to prevent the further release of toxin. The drug of, drug of choice is metronidazole. It is given 400 mg rectally or 500 mg IV every 6 hours for 7 days. 
penicillin can be given alternatively. Other, tra other treatment must show is symptomatic treatment. In symptomatic treatment, antispasmodic drugs like benzodiazepines can be given. The wound that leads to the entry of this bacteria should be identified and cleaned to prevent the anaerobic environment of infection. The tetanus patient should be isolated in the separate room as any noxious stimulus can aggravate the spasm. It's about treatment. Next, let's see how we can prevent the tetanus. tetanus the tetanus toxoid is used for the active immunization of the tetanus, which is available either as monovalent vaccine or compound vaccine. DPT is an example of compound vaccine, which consisting of diphtheria toxoid, produces whole cell killed preparation and tetanus toxoid. In primary immunization of children, the tetanus toxoid is given under National Immunization Schedule of India. Total 7 doses are given. 3 doses of DPT at 6, 10, 14 weeks of birth followed by 2 booster doses of DPT at 16 to 24 weeks and 5 years followed by 2 additional doses of TT at 10 years and 16 years. Adult immunization is done if primary immunization is not administered in childhood. 4 doses of TT is given, 2 doses of TT at 1 month interval followed by 2 booster doses at 1 year and 6, year, six years. Site of vaccination is deep intramuscular root at anterolateral aspect of the thigh in case of children and in deltoid in case of adult. To know about the prevention of tetanus after injury, just go through this table once. The old slides of this lecture are available in my Instagram page and the link of my Insta page is given in this description box. Next, let's see how we prevent the neonatal tetanus. Neonatal tetanus is defined by the World Health Organization as an illness occurring in a child who loses the ability to suck and cry between day 3 and 28 of life and become rigid and has spasms. It is also known as 8th day disease as the symptoms usually starts after one week of birth. Most common reasons of neonatal tetanus is unhygienic practices during delivery such as infected umbilical stumps due to application of cow dung and rarely neonatal tetanus can be due to circumcision or by ear piercing. Neonatal tetanus is seasonal and it is more common in July August and September months. Neonatal tetanus can be prevented by discouraging home deliveries and promoting hospital or attended deliveries. An aseptic clean practice should be followed during deliveries like clean hand, clean surface, clean blade for cutting the cord, clean cord tie, clean cord stem, clean towel and clean water. In pregnant women, two doses of tetanus toxoid vaccine is recommended. It's about today's video. If you like my video, please don't forget to subscribe my channel. Okay, thank you guys for watching. And if you have any doubts, just comment in the comment box. Take care.